all of you. It's so good to be with each one of you. And uh, welcome to those of you who have never joined us before. This is our once a month, once every five weeks, we do an open call. It's called Leadership Talks. And we invite the greater body of Christ to join in and be part of what we're doing and check out, you know, some of the things that we're doing. Leaders Alliance is a global community of kingdom-minded leaders that have joined together to actually create co coalition, to create a sense of collaboration, to see God's kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We have right now four or five uh, catalyst groups. One is focused towards church ministry, another focused towards marketplace, another focused towards prophetic and intercession, another focused towards outreach and impact. We really believe that God wants to actually bring the different giftings of the body of Christ together in a powerful way so that Jesus would be, in a sense, reconstituted. You know, I think of a, I think of a jigsaw puzzle where all the pieces are separate, but they all need to be brought together so we get the full picture of who Jesus is. Or we can think of the other analogy that I use is like white light from the sun shining through a prism and refracting into different colors. Well, when all those colors come back together, the white light is restored. We want to see Jesus fully manifested in the earth, but it's going to take every believer from every different gift mix, from every different passion stream, from every different denomination coming together in some kind of dynamic unity to see the fullness of Jesus, the fullness of him who fills all in all impacting the church. And that's why even today we have a special topic that we're going to actually be focusing on, which I'm super excited about, which is talking about the synergy between two of the ministry gifts that Jesus gave to the church. So we're going to be talking about the synergy, the partnership between the apostolic and prophetic giftings in the body of Christ. And, um, and we're going to teach this in, you know, a few different segments. And then we're going to just uh, pause and have some of our catalyst leaders share a little bit. If, if you have a question while I'm teaching, please put it in the uh, chat room and Jordan will pull it up and, and uh, we'll address it the best we can as we go through this uh, teaching together. But I also want to mention that there's notes available in the chat room. So if you go there at the bottom, just download those notes and you'll be able to follow along with the five sort of areas that we want to cover today around the synergy between the apostolic and prophetic. So let's let's launch in. See, I believe that Jesus is in the process now of restoring his church to a higher level of impact in the world. And one of the key elements of that is a rediscovery and a re-implementation of two of the most important gifts in the body of Christ, the gift of apostle and prophet. And so I want to see that happen, but I believe that there's a lot of missteps that we can make. There's a lot of problems we can produce. There's a lot of, uh, let's say, false values that we can implement. There's a lot of false models that can come in that can actually, in a sense, undermine or sabotage the restoration of these two very important ministry gifts. See, my history with these two gifts goes back into the mid-70s. I was part of a ministry um, with a man named Jim Durkin. It was called Gospel Outreach. And Jim was working together with a number of other leaders, such as uh, uh, Dick Iverson, Dick Benjamin, uh, um, gosh, some of the guys on the East Coast, uh, Charles Schultz, uh, Larry Tomzak, and uh, Dave, uh, Bill Hammond. There was a number of people that were exploring, what does it mean to see the fullness of Christ? What does it mean to see the beautiful passage of Ephesians 4, 7 through 16, to see that restored to the church so that we could actually impact the world in a greater way? And I believe that some of that effort was really wonderful and powerful. Some of it was misguided. Some of it went into kind of dominionism, where we're going to control everything. Some of it went into governmental emphasis, where shepherding came out of that. Um, there were some mistakes made because we were using like a military model or we were using a corporation model. Um, I believe the key to the restoration of these gifts is actually neither of those. It's the family model. And we'll talk about that a little bit as we go ahead. But I began to be exposed to ordained apostles and prophets and just really started to really appreciate this truth from Scripture. But at the same time, I also began to see some of the challenges, and I was, in a sense, uh, injured by some of those challenges as well. But it's interesting because the unique partnership between these two ministries is essential. 
In fact, if you look at Ephesians 4 and Ephesians 2, we see in Ephesians 2.20 that the church is to be built on a foundation of the apostles and prophets. And we'll get into that in just a moment. But I've actually also experienced it because my wife and I, Diane, and Diane couldn't be on the call today, but Diane is very prophetic. And she's carried just a massive prophetic gift all of our lives. I tend to be a little bit more apostolic. And so we tend to function together in that way. She gets words of knowledge. I get words of wisdom. You know, there's, there's this combination. I She tends to see the um, the challenges a mile off. I tend to kind of be oblivious, but they I, I know how to deal with them when they hit my face, you know? And so there's this little bit of a difference. I tend to be more strategic. She tends to be more intuitive. These are the, the dynamics that often manifest in relationship to the prophetic gifting and the apostolic gifting. We want to talk about that today in a way that actually produces maximum impact and results. Okay, so, but there are challenges to reintroducing these gifts in the church, and we're going to talk about those challenges to some extent. I mean, one time, one challenge that we see a lot is that all the prophets tend to gather together over here, all the apostles tend to gather together over there, and they don't often intersect, nor do they often uh, cross-pollinate in a way that God intended. And so what happens is we see this stuff happening over here that's a little bit off base, but still they're they're honest and sincere in their effort to rediscover the gift. And the same thing happens over here. Why don't we bring those two things together? Instead of having a school of the apostles and a school of the prophets at different times, let's bring them together. Let's figure out how they function in dynamic synergy with one another so that Jesus can be glorified in the church. See, I believe God desires to renew the partnership between the apostolic and the prophetic. And I believe the key to that happening is that we need to actually see how scripture brings the two together. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment. But I believe that God is doing an amazing work in the body of Christ right now to bring us to a place where he's restoring the priesthood of every believer. And one dimension of that priesthood is that every single one of us carries the giftings of Christ. And I believe that the fullness of that revelation of the gifts of Christ will only be manifested when we start to see our absolute need for one another, our need for the synergy of the body of Christ, that we need to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to begin to recognize the gifting and the abilities and the graces that are on each one of us. And then we need to begin to partner in some dynamic uh, um tangible way so that we can see Jesus manifested. Now, this takes place on the universal level where we're talking about God's movement in different regions and nations and cities and so forth, that we need to see the body of Christ come together in unity. But it's not just unity, oh, I love you and you love me, but it's really unity in co-workership, that the gifting that God has placed in my life would come together with the gifting God's placed in your life, and we would see tangible results from the unity and the synergy of the body of Christ. And so we're going to take that concept and focus it a little bit more directly in terms of the universal unity and synergy, but also the local church unity and synergy. We want to see God come, God's spirit and power bring together the gifting so that ultimately Jesus will be fully manifested in his people. So that's our introduction. Why don't we stop there? And I just want to see from our, our, our team leaders, you know, Franklin and John Bootsma, JT, you know, there's a few of us here, uh, Jeff Whitmer. Do you guys have any kind of just opening idea here. We'll take one or two and then we'll move on. But give us a, a sense of your thoughts about the synergy and particularly between these two giftings. So yeah, frankly, I can, you want to I take can jump first? in. Yeah. I can jump in on that. Uh I think Michael, you're absolutely right. And and particularly in saying that, you know, the prophetic people gather in one corner and the apostolic people gather in another corner and they don't often work together. And, uh, you know, in order to build anything, you're going to need a team and you're going to need a team that know each other and trust each other. Yes. And, you know, we've got to get in the same room together and start working together. And one of the issues that we've had is that um, 
okay, we have these clusters gathering in different areas that aren't working together, but also you like here in Europe, I don't know any other office of the prophet mm, here. Yeah. You know, I don't know any apostolic people that live anywhere near me. And okay. so, you know, we have this geographical issue as well, and maybe it's a little more different in the US or other places, but, you know, very, very hard to find high level people Amen. to start to build these relationships. So, well, that's a real important point. And I, I think that we need to start being a little bit more aggressive, a little bit more assertive in terms of discovering uh, our counterparts across the body of Christ at this time. Any other thoughts from some of our Catalyst leaders before we move into the second portion of our talk today? Okay. Um, I'm happy to jump in here, Michael. Um, I completely agree as well. And uh, I think one of the things that perhaps has hindered it in times past, meaning the synergy and the coming together, and, it, and it's a reminder I've got really from John 14, 18, where Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans. I think much of what's happened in the body of Christ is that our hearts get healed up and we can actually start to celebrate with somebody else carries rather than get jealous and envious by yes. it. Yes. And so if we can celebrate it and realize that our gifting or your gifting is really not for you, it's for everybody else. Yes, And we can celebrate that as family, like you're saying, I feel that it will bring us to a place where, where the unity we carry is a unity in the higher call, the cause of Christ, the great commandment, the great commission, and the orphanness, the orphan tendency, the orphan behavior, the orphan speech, if, if really the healing of our hearts can be left behind, I feel like we can be an incredible uh, agent of change and a fulfillment of biblical scripture and prophecy for the world around us, where even like they said about the early disciples, hey, we, we, we know you're Jesus' disciples because of the love we see for one, that you have for one another. And so I long for the point where, where even in my own heart and life, I don't get jealous, I don't get envious, but I can celebrate what somebody else carries. And I think that's one of the things that the Holy Spirit's doing across the board across the body of Christ. And I feel like it's coming to a place where we're really going to see the fruition and the maturity of that, and therefore an incredible expression of Christ-likeness to bring that synergy together. That's so good. And I just have to say that John Bootsma's wife is one of the most, you know, kind of recognized prophetic voices in the body of Christ in our stream, at least right now. She's incredibly gifted. So he's had a hands-on experience of how to walk together and appreciate the gifting of his wife. But um, so we're going to go into the next section of our talk, understanding the biblical importance. Now, obviously, we could spend 10, 15, 20 hours going through the scripture as it pertains to this. But I want to just highlight a few things, because I think most of us already know these scriptures. We just want to kind of bring out a few points that are important to this. And Catalyst leaders, if you have a comment you want to make, just put your hand up and I'll call on you after this next section. But understanding the biblical importance of these ministries is so essential. See, I am, if you know me at all, you know that I have a passion for the book of Ephesians and particularly the what I consider to be the mountain peak of that book, which is Ephesians chapter four, especially verses seven through 16. Okay, and you guys know verse 11, he gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Okay, that's a given. And that's so essential. But the problem with our interpretation of this passage is we've isolated that one verse and we've sort of exalted that one verse in a way that's neglected the other verses around it. See, when verse 7 begins, it says, each one of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, I don't have time to teach this because there's a lot to be unpacked from that one verse, but I do want to focus on the fact that to each one of us, gifts were given. Okay, to each one of us. So I believe that these five gifts that are about to be mentioned are not just exclusive to those who have distinguished themselves as high level imparters and equippers in those giftings, but I believe these gifts are available to every single person in the body of Christ, according to verse 7, according to verse 12, and according to verse 16. And so I want you to hear this clearly, that I believe these giftings are, are like fabric in the body of Christ. And in fact, I think we make a mistake when we emphasize the gifted ones too much, because if we emphasize the gifted ones too much, we do so in a way that kind of creates a priesthood and laity separation. 
And the other thing we need to remember is the key verse of this passage is not verse 11, it's verse 12. These gifts were given to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. In other words, these gifts aren't so that somebody can stand on a stage with a microphone and preach. No, these gifts were given to actually impart aspects of the nature and gifting of Christ to the church so that every single member is functioning in the apostolic, prophetic, evangelistic, pastoral, and teaching gifts. So that ultimately, verse 12 is the most important verse. And if verse 12 is happening, it happens until the time when we come in the unity of the faith and the fullness of the Son of God unto a perfect man, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. See, ultimately, these gifts were given to impact the church so that the church would represent Jesus in his fullness that we'd no longer be immature, but we grow up into him in all things, and that ultimately verse 16 would be manifested. So we understand from scripture that these gifts are important, but we also have to understand that these gifts are nothing other than the ministries of Jesus manifested in his church. So Jesus is the apostle and high priest of our faith. Jesus was known as the great prophet. So we see those two things in Hebrews 3, Matthew 21, and a, and a dozen other places that these, the gift of apostle and prophet, are two aspects of the gifting of Jesus that when he ascended on high, he poured out into his people. And so these gifts are nothing other than him, but they are at least two massive expressions of Jesus, along with the three other gifts of evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Okay, but we need to understand that these two gifts, the ones that we're focusing on today, the apostolic and prophetic, are actually set apart in scripture as being a little bit more foundational to the health of the church. So it says in Ephesians 2.20 that, that the church is built on the foundations of the apostles and prophets. Now, some people would say, well, those are the 12 apostles of the Lamb and the Old Testament prophets, and that could be some dimension of application. But then you look three or four verses later into chapter 3, verse 5, and it says these things were hidden in times past, but now they're being revealed to God's holy apostles and prophets. What was it particularly? Well, talking about the one new man, the Jew and the Gentile coming together. And some people would say, well, that's only about the Jew and Gentile. No, I don't believe so although it is particularly about the Jew and Gentile, but I believe these two gifts functioning together are part of the eternal well-being of the church, that the church is a tabernacle, a temple of God's presence and power, and that church is built on a foundation. Jesus Christ is the foundation, but the apostle and prophet, you know, uh, work with Jesus to establish that foundational reality. Okay, and so these two ministry gifts are essential. Apostolic leaders are builders who take the vision, the blueprint of heaven, and they turn it into a mission. They gather the people and the resources. They assign the responsibilities. They actually partner with Jesus to see the church built in a dynamic and powerful way and the culture of the kingdom manifested on earth. That that's the simple definition of the apostolic and of course, there's much more that could be said. The prophetic leaders are those who actually are ministers of the presence and power of God. So all that is vertical, I believe, is in the domain of the prophetic gifting. Prof the word prophetes in the Greek means to receive and to declare the, the word of the Lord. And, and the word apostolic means to be sent and to train others to be sent. And so these two dynamics working together are partnered according to the Spirit of God to work together to see God's kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in, in heaven. Now, the apostolic by itself is powerful, but it cannot actually um, perform the same uh, or, or supply the same resource that the prophetic supplies. The same is true in reverse. Prophetic gifting is important, but it cannot actually supply the things that the apostolic gift supplies. We need to bring those two gifting together in dynamic harmony and unity to see the purposes of God fulfilled in the earth. Now, these purposes are not only sort of big picture purposes, 
because those are important, but they're also the very specific purposes of apostolic impartation to the average believer, according to verse 12 of Ephesians 4, where that gifting is bringing resource. And so that a, a person who's, let's say, gifted as a teacher or gifted as a pastor can be made more apostolic because of that apostolic gifting, the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry in the specific area of the gifting defined in verse 11. The same is true on the prophetic side. The prophetic people just don't exist to show off as prophets. They exist primarily to raise up prophetic sons and daughters who will then turn in turn raise up the next generation of prophetic people because of verse 12 is essential to the understanding of this entire passage. So again, we want to move forward now in understanding how these things work together biblically, but then we also want to look at in the next section how they work practically. Okay, but Linton has his hands up. Linton is our catalyst leader, or two, one of our two catalyst leaders for the marketplace ministry. Uh, Linton, why don't you speak up and share your thought? Yeah, there's so many thoughts, and I love what uh, John said. Certainly, um, understanding our sonship is, is core, but, you know, I'm, I'm really reminded that, you know, after Jesus has the foundation, the foundation becomes the apostolic and the, and the prophetic, and, and to a large degree, they share, to me, they share a common theme. I call one the, the builder tension, and the other is the prophetic tension. So because we see from heaven and we look at earth, there's this tension between the way things are and the way things we know things can be. And I really believe without strong apostolic covering, the prophetic kind of flounders. It does, it's not as impactful. It doesn't really come out in a way, in a strong, impactful way that it can without that apostolic covering. So there's this shared piece, which is the tension, but then how do we work that out? And I think that's where they come together in, in, in dealing with that tension. What is the process to build according to the map that we might lay out uh, to look like heaven? It's so good. Wow. Great insights. Any, any other of our team want to add a thought to that? Because this is, this is really what we're trying to do is we're trying to, in a sense, even model it by having some of our leaders sharing pieces of this, this understanding so that we can say, hey, you know, these, we get a more complete picture, not just when Michael teaches, but when others are also contributing their thoughts and bringing these, these understandings together. So, uh, yeah, yeah, Jeff and Sherry, any thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, I'll jump in here. I guess I'll, I'll combine both the sections that you taught into one. The, the synergy, I think, is so important, but synergy, I think, has to begin within us, yeah. um, a recognition of the gifts we carry, because I was thinking, um, I have the heart of a pastor, but I think strategically like an apostle, but my strongest anointing seems to be on the prophetic. Wow. So if I learn to recognize that in myself, then I can start to collaborate with other people because I, I recognize it in them. But I was thinking of this um, apostolic and prophetic working together in a practical sense as a pastor who thinks strategically, I was thinking of the priestly and prophetic functions of, of Jesus, you know, where the, the, the pastor and the, let's put it, the apostolic can reach people where they're at. And that's yes. that priestly function, touch people where they're at, but that prophetic can define like where they are not, but where they could go. Yes. And that prophetic can, can take them from the present moment in, into the future and actually build a strategy to actually take them there. And that's I think that's mean. what inspires hope. So the priestly without the prophetic only creates therapy within the community. <laughs> um, but if we can have the apostolic that can actually create movement and momentum when it's fueled by the prophetic anointing. That's so so I, I love how we're starting to process this, but I think we each need to come to a place where I need to understand how this is working in my life, like where my anointing is. Uh, so I'm really glad you're bringing some clarity to this, these facets of Christ's nature in us. That's so good. So good. Sherry, do you have anything to kind of add on top of that? 
Now, the only thing that I, I sit here so curious because I love to watch people's gifts interact with one another. Yeah. And for me, I would like to see conversation between a strong apostolic gifting and a strong prophetic gifting and just have them just like talk out their differences in their viewpoints. Yes. I think yes. that would be very interesting for us to see the tension there. Yeah. And um, I think that could be. That's like between Michael and I a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, let's, let's do that. You know, let's, let's really set that up for That's a, a good point. Talks. There is tension there. There, there definitely can be friction between apostolic strategies and pastoral or prophetic strategies it definitely could be some friction there but i think it's a good friction it's what sharpens yeah. us well can i ask you andrew and K kath to hold your thoughts for just this next sure. section because uh we'll be hitting the same thought again and again so i'd love to hold your comments for a, a, another section here and i'll i'll hit this next portion um where we talk about these ministries are designed to function in partnership Okay, so let's go into that section right now, that they're designed by God to function in partnership. And we see two amazing examples of this in the book of Acts. And one is in Acts chapter 13. Now, in Acts chapter 13, what you see is you see uh, Peter had sent Barnabas to actually begin a church you know, in the north, and he sent them up there. And uh, Barnabas actually was the one who, who went after Paul and brought Paul up into uh, Damascus while when Paul had actually uh, had his conversion experience. And so what we have is we have, or actually in Antioch, I'm sorry. So they were in Antioch and they were gathered together, it says, with certain teachers and prophets. Now, this is an interesting picture because they were sent by apostolic commissioning to Antioch, but they were actually only identified as teachers and prophets in this particular gathering. They were fasting and praying, waiting on the Lord, and the Holy Spirit spoke. Now, how did he speak? He might have spoken audibly to everybody, but I think he liked, it's more likely that he spoke through a couple of the prophets. Okay, and he said, separate me, Paul and Barnabas, for the work whereunto I call them. And then after they fasted and prayed some more, they laid hands on them and sent them out. So we see the emergence of this new class of apostolic leaders being sent forth by the prophets and the teachers. Now, we're assuming also that 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 Barnabas and, and Paul were in that number. Paul was probably identified as one of the teachers. Barnabas might have been one of the teachers, or maybe he was identified prophetically at this point, but he had not been yet commissioned as an apostle, but they laid hands on them and they sent them forth. And at that moment, their designation was shifted. Now, they had always had apostolic dimensions. I believe Barnabas had always been more of a pastoral apostle. Paul had been more of a teaching apostle. But now they're partnered together. They're commissioned by the church to go out. And this is an example of the relationship at one level between the prophetic and apostolic. The other one that's really interesting to note is when the debate came about God's spirit being poured out on the Gentiles. And so Peter shares his story in Acts chapter 15, and then Paul and Barnabas share their testimony of how God began to move among the, 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 the Greek converts, but then also just among the Gentiles. And then we have this big debate, and there's a lot of disagreement, there's a lot of, you know, issues coming up, and then, and then James the Lord's brother stands up and he says, no, I have a revelation. And he speaks prophetically to the situation. He says, this is what the prophet Amos was saying when God spoke through prophet Amos and said, I will rebuild again the tabernacle of J David so that all the nations would be gathered under the one banner of Christ. And so this is, this is how, and then a little bit later they said, okay, we're going to send out Paul and Barnabas with this letter of confirmation that God is moving among the Gentiles. They don't have to become Jews in order to be saved. They just have to honor the Mosaic, I'm sorry, the Noahic covenant. And so they, he sends them out, but then he sends with them, as you look later in the chapter, and it says that they sent also Silas and Judas with them who were prophets to confirm the word. 
So they built an apostolic prophetic team to send out this directive from Jerusalem to the rest of the body of Christ that they have now agreed that God is moving among the Gentiles, that they don't have to convert to Judaism in the totality of the Judaic law, but they can actually come to Christ directly. What an amazing example of the union of the apostolic and prophetic working together to bring the word of the Lord. Okay, and so, but here's my thought is that when they don't work together, what we see is we see sort of a half picture of what ought to be. And I believe that the Lord wants to restore the full picture of apostolic prophetic revelation to the body of Christ. See, here's one of my pet sayings is that as I've coached churches, I've come to the conclusion there's three kinds of churches, fantasy, factory, and family. And family is the model of the kingdom, but sometimes we're in fantasy, which is we go through all the motions, but we never get anywhere. I mean, I know churches that have a healing every Sunday, but they haven't baptized somebody in six months. Well, you know, again, we're not representing the totality of Jesus. We're worshiping and praying and preaching every Sunday, but the church is not impacting the world for Christ. Okay, that's kind of the epitome of, of the fantasy church. The factory church is where we... We programatize and systematize everything so carefully, but ultimately we do it on a wrong value system. Factory exists for the benefit of the owner. Family exists for the benefit of the next generation. And that is what is truly apostolic. But here's my statement, is that prophetic without the apostolic will tend to produce a fantasy. The apostolic without the prophetic will tend to produce a factory. But when the prophetic and the apostolic come together in dynamic synergy, that's where the true possibility of spiritual family can be realized, along with the other three gifts, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, but on the foundation of the apostolic and prophetic. So here we are, we need to re-emphasize the reconnection between these two ministries if we want to see Jesus fully manifested in the earth, in all of his glory, in all of his beauty, and in all of his impact. We need to see the body of Christ come together, because that's where the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. So, Andrew, why don't you speak up uh, and uh, and take a moment here and share with us what was on your heart a few moments ago? Yeah, thank you, Michael. Yes, uh, I, I love the emphasis that the factory church is only for the benefit of the owner, and that's where this, that was the uh, kind of the wrong on the, the shepherding movement and everything. But um, I, I guess I have one comment and then one plea. For, for I guess for help, one yeah. is um, is and I think I shared on the broadcast last week. Uh, you know the apostles and prophets usually are lone rangers. Yeah. Um, very independent. But now if we could bring those two personalities or callings together, then you have you know the foundation which it talks about in Ephesians two. And what does it talk about? Creating a, a habitation creating the mm. and, and so you're creating the culture of honor and from the presence of god and so if, if that doesn't happen then acts excuse me ephesians 4 with the fivefold ministry moving together isn't that effective there's yeah. got to be that, like john was talking about that that um, culture of celebrating one another really making the atmosphere where god wants to live he really puts his takes his shoes off and puts his socks up on the table yes. that's the comment now both you and and uh, and uh, john and somebody else in the team are married to prophetic women okay yes. i move in the apostolic my wife moves in prophetic um can you kind of help us to, to so we can I feel like we're not really using our potential together. Yeah. I mean, she kind of ministers at the church and she just came back from a great woman's conference last night. Uh, but how can we really move together? I need to honor her prophetic more. Wow. Well, why don't, why don't we first of all have uh, Kathy, Kathy uh, uh, speak to that, okay? Can you kind of share from your perspective how that works for you? Um. Because we are the founders of the church, I mean, 
we have a lot of liberty probably maybe other people might not have yeah. that we're, you know we're always conversing in the house and what we're doing where we're going um i mean i have freedom if i have a word to give um apostolic i think um we definitely recognize it's intentional we recognize our calling i'm also apostolic with him i love working with our church plans love investing in them and particularly now in this season um I don't know. Um, just, I don't know. Be, I guess being an apostolic is very visionary, visionary, really always going ahead. I mean, yes. also going ahead. I'm always like, okay, let's process where we are. God's done so much. Let's process. Sometimes it, I, I feel, sometimes it's the pull of, hey, let's live in the minute too. You know, let's enjoy okay. the victory and what just happened. We're just, we're playing some new churches again, new things happening. And it's like, wow, I mean, enjoy where I sometimes I've felt with Andrew with the apostolic, he is just always on the go and he's always seeing more and beyond. And it's great. And so then the prophet, I think a lot of times I'm the one saying, all right, that's good, but let's be careful of this. That's one thing. I feel like um, her prophetic gifts a lot of time are breaks. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and so I want her, I want her to move more in the uh, the seeing beyond too. I guess that's yeah. it. I think, I think I, I just received my own answer. We just need to pray together and yes. with recognizing the giftings. Yeah. And, and one thing we have to realize too, is that these gifts aren't like just a, a complete package in themselves. There's actually dimensions mm -hmm. and flavors of gifting. And so we have to realize that they're, the gifting will manifest different. You can be have prophet A, prophet B, prophet C, prophet D, and each one of them will have a different flavor of prophetic, the same out with the apostolic. Why don't you, Chris, why don't you give us your comment and what you're thinking there, Chris Stevens? Yeah, I think just to, to that point right there, I think we're all made very differently. And so yes. basically your personality could even flavor, uh, you know, whether you're putting on brakes or, or going to, but you know, for my wife and I, same thing again, um, very apostolic. She's very prophetic. And it is a process to learn to work together and to partner. And, right. and uh, I think sometimes we rely on our own gifting a little bit. And, and so, again, I can see pictures and have a, a blueprint and all that kind of stuff, but get stuck. And sometimes, you know, I'm trying to figure it out. And finally, I'll say something to her. Uh, you know, about what I'm working on. And she'll say, well, that's kind of interesting because two weeks ago, you know, I had this picture and something and, and, uh, and she's like, but I, I couldn't figure it out. And so I didn't, I didn't say anything because I hadn't figured it all out yet. And I'm like, that was the piece I needed. And so I think exactly. for us, we're learning, you know, rather than each of us try to figure it all out and then wait to share it till we have it all together. The reality that we're not going to have it all together. And it's like puzzle pieces. Yeah, we need to take our piece and put it out there on the table and see where it begins to fit together. Because often she has the piece that I'm missing. I have the piece that she's missing. And when we get together, uh, it's it's really amazing and beautiful. And and so it's really cool to see how the Lord has has done that. That's so good. In fact, uh, last week, uh, Laura had a word for me just about, you know, even what we're doing here today. And it was a really good word. And I just feel like a uh, she, she really carries something that's very powerful. So let's move on to the next point, which we're going to get into a little bit. Well, what are the obstacles? What hinders us from the partnership? Because, you know, we've referred to a little, a few of those right now, especially in the husband wife team, when there's one that's apostolic and one's prophetic, and it's not always the husband as the apostolic, the wife as the prophetic. I've seen the inverse too many times, but let's go into this next section, obstacles to the apostolic prophetic partnership. First of all, I think the apostolic temperament tends to be a little utilitarian and task oriented. So, you know, my people used to joke about me when I was pastoring, like Michael loves you and he has a wonderful plan for your life. And so if I ever got, you know, sort of, if I ever realized that I was actually, you know, stressing people or injuring them a little bit, it's because I saw how they fit into the, the purposes of God, but I didn't really pay as much attention to them as an individual person of God. 
And so that would be tend to be one of the challenges that apostolic people can manifest is that you're so focused on the task as opposed to the people who are carrying out the task. And that's why we need the pastoral gift to be functioning because, and we need actually our, our apostolic leaders to be more pastoral as well, because we need to be able to see the totality of Jesus. He was caring about individuals at the same time as giving us the great commission. Okay, so both come together. And sometimes also, I think one of the defects within the, the temperament of an apostolic leader is that they tend to be very success oriented, very outcome oriented. And that can produce if they don't have a true spirit of sonship and adoption, it can actually produce an ambitious spirit that drives people and burns them out. Okay, and this can be a defect in the heart of an apostolic leader that can actually produce difficulty. And I can just name names if you want me to of different leaders that have actually produced movements that have actually harmed people because they were so focused on uh, on the success, the outcome of the of the organization. Okay, and that's also the flip side of that is fear of failure that a lot of leaders are driven by that fear of failure in a way that isn't, um, isn't at rest in the spirit of God. And I can confess that I've had challenges with that through my life. You know, uh, I, those, those issues that have, that have hit me as a more apostolically gifted person. But also, you can be very vulnerable to disappointment because if things don't go your way, you can actually go, you know, kind of a little bit you know, bipolar on the issue and, and hit some deep lows if you're not careful as an apostolic leader. Now, let's flip over and look at the prophetic a little bit in this same section of our notes. The prophetic temperament will tend to be intuitive, but also impulsive and tend to be a little bit reactionary, like, oh, the word of the Lord came, this is what we're supposed to do. Oh, no, the word of the Lord came next week, this is the other thing we're supposed to do. And it can be kind of confusing, because there's so much intuitive responsiveness in the heart of a prophetic leader, that you can actually uh, be challenged on that level. Okay, the next thing, though, is you can also, you know, many people who are prophetic are prophetic before they're mature. And so they end up actually sharing their prophetic revelations in a way that most pastors become offended by. And so most pastors are trying to, you know, um, sort of silence that prophetic person prematurely, not understanding that there's a maturation process that needs to take place. And if you actually misunderstand them or accuse them of being uh, too bossy or too judgmental or too white and black or too reactionary, then you can actually harm them and generate almost like a spirit of rejection. And this can even be rooted deeply in a, in a prophetic person's childhood, because, you know, I believe these gifts are actually starting to be worked in our lives at a very early age. And if a prophetic person is, is seeing something and speaking to it, but they're speaking without maturity, they can offend people and be rejected. And then a spirit of rejection begins to grow. And I don't know, you know, I've probably pastored dozens of prophetic people over the years. And most prophetic people, not all, but most, have to really come through the healing process of a spirit of rejection and really repent of any ownership or any, any partnership they've developed with that, with that mental attitude in order to really step into the freedom of their true gifting. Okay, so we see there's obstacles. So many, many apostolic leaders are afraid of their prophetic people, or they're just passive in relationship to them, whereas the partnership then breaks down. Or on the other hand, many prophetic people see the defects of an apostolic leader going too fast, too far, too quickly in a way that burns people out, and they become reactive and draw away. We want to see the partnership between those two giftings, that the apostolic has a strategy, he has a plan, she has a vision, she has a sense of purpose, but she also needs to be attentive to the immediate word of the Lord. The prophetic people are tuned into heaven, but in a way that doesn't always, uh, you know, serve the, the focus of the apostolic vision. So that needs to be brought into right relationship as healing, as, uh, as the right spirit is cultivated within the hearts of your apostolic and prophetic people. And these and other temperamental challenges can hinder partnership in the kingdom. 
So why don't I stop there? Any comments from some of our team members? I'd love to hear from you, Franklin, on that issue of some of the personality challenges that often develop in a prophetic person's uh, life. And, and if anyone else on our team has, has uh, input, just put up your hand. But if you can talk about that for a second here. Yeah, I think um, I think you've got a lot of wisdom on this topic, uh, Michael, so I commend you on that. Um, yeah, knowing a lot of prophetic people, uh, I would say very few of them have gotten to where they're at without some wounds along the way. Yes. And, uh, and it is very, very important that uh, that does not become the lens that they prophesy through. Mm, that's and that's right. very, very easy to happen. Um, because we're still human beings in the, in this whole process. Yeah. So, um, you know, many, many prophetic people um, have gone through their maturing uh, process, which is, you know, typically decades long, yes. um, not under some sort of apostolic covering, you know, they, they've, they've been in, in churches that were not spirit filled. They were not led by apostles. Uh, they were typically led by pastors. Uh, and you've got this whole package of personalities, misunderstandings, uh, judgments, all kinds of stuff uh, go along the way. And, and there's the old expression, you know, wounded people wound other people. Yes. And this happens in spades around, uh, around the prophetic. And so, so true. You know, we, we need this area of healthy people yeah. uh, stepping into uh, a level of gifts that's going to bring health into the body of Christ. And that health really begins with that sense of a, the spirit of adoption, the spirit of sonship and daughterhood in Christ, that if we know who we are in Christ and who Christ is in us, that's the starting point of the spiritual and let's call it temperament health that God wants to be manifested within the prophetic people. Jordan, what are your thoughts quickly? And then, and then we'll go to John. Yeah, I think there's a, this, this opens up a whole big conversation on just understanding traits of leaders. And, and if we can understand the traits of the people around us, we can really begin to um, not react to what's going on in other people, but realize that they're, they're actually exercising their leadership out of a certain perspective and a gift that the Lord's given them. And we can begin to, um, see these sort of negative traits that you've, you've, you've given us here, but also what are the positive side of those traits mm -hmm. and how to sort of overlook things. And, and you begin to not make such a big deal out of some of the negative stuff as well. I think that, you know, it's important for you specifically to know this with it, when it comes to your team, for example, um, I am, I'm more of a servant leader model type guy. That's, that's very natural to me. Michael, is a very transformational leader. Now those, those leadership styles come with different traits, but I have learned kind of how Michael leads. I know how I lead and I know where I can supplement him and his leadership and where he can supplement me. Yes. And so, although we have two different styles, I've learned how to work with Michael and realize that he's not exactly like me but we can come together and do something bigger together than we would have been able to do by ourselves. That's so, so good. Yeah. So good. John. Yes. Um, I think again, culture is so crucial because Ooh, yes. I agree with the woundedness. I've seen it. The prophetic gifting when it gets going is like has, has the wow factor, but if we can instill within the culture of our churches or, you know, movements, whatever they are, ministries that, more important than gifting and people need to know we honor them for their gifting we value their gifting but more important we want to know character mm. and and the the ability to relate to somebody first and foremost because they're created in the image of god they're an image bearer of who jesus is 
But then as we develop that relationship so that they know that they're not valued primarily for their gifting, they're valued primarily because they're human being created in God's image. And then as they get to know them, we get to know the character. There's a really a no stress period, you know, as, as far as they know that we're not going to call on them because of their gifting primarily. Then I think once you've laid that foundation, it's so much easier to begin to build into it because it's the relational bank account. People, yes. even prophetic people, especially because there can be a bit of a hypersensitivity there. But if they know, if we've been able to deposit, make deposits into the relational bank account, yeah. then if even if there's a perceived withdrawal, which I think is an actual deposit again, but if it's a perceived right. withdrawal, then there's that strong sense of, okay, they love me. They've demonstrated their love. This is a safe place. I can begin to exercise my prophetic gifting. And I think then you're actually raising up a mature prophetic voice that has been built on a foundation of relational connection. And I love you not primarily because of your incredible gifting, because ultimately it can get to a point that people feel used because of their gift. And you don't want that either, because that's not good for culture. Right. And that's why the family model that we talk about in other places is so essential. Because if you're just, you know, trying to get the job done, if you're apostolic and you're trying to, let's say, plant new churches or or establish uh, new ministries within a church, or you're trying to raise up new ministers, but you're doing so in a utilitarian way, you're going to actually create a problem. If you're a father in a household and you're doing that, you'd create a problem. Or on the other hand, if you're prophetic and you're trying to, you know, produce prophetic outcomes, gosh, you know, those, that's a challenge there because you can actually burn people out or you can actually, you know, celebrate some and disregard others in a way that could produce harm. And so we have to enter into this with the right set of values and really understanding the, the culture of honor and the value of, of respect and love for one another and how love really is at the center of all of these uh, synergies. All right. So let's move into the final portion and then we're going to open it up. If there's any questions or thoughts, please put them in the chat room or you can speak up in just a moment. We're going to go to about 15 after the hour, but let's dive into this final thing because I want to talk about the benefits of synergy between the apostolic and prophetic. Okay, because there's a ton. And, you know, literally the scripture is crucial. You know, if we look at the, the relationship between the Old and New Testament, we see, in a sense, the prophets and the apostles working together. If we look at the immediate examples, a couple of them I've given, but we also look at some of the other examples in the book of Acts or even within the ministry of Jesus, when we see the prophetic side of Jesus and the apostolic side of Jesus working in tandem with one another. See, all of these aspects are so, so, so crucial. And so what are the benefits that we can hope to achieve? Well, the first benefit, I believe, is that the foundation of the church can be reestablished. See, as I've said before, in many contexts, unfortunately, over the last 1500 years, the church has dr gradually drifted off of the foundation of apostles and prophets, and has been reestablished on the foundation of pastors and teachers. And again, those are two very essential giftings but those two giftings were never intended to be foundational, okay? The apostolic is we go, we're sent ones. The prophetic is we go in the presence and power of God. If you look at the two final words that Jesus spoke in Matthew 28, it's the apostolic commission. Go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and teaching them to do everything I've commanded you. It's about doing. But then in Acts chapter 1, Jesus says this, which is also, I believe, the prophetic commission is wait for power from on high and then you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. Those two, the apostolic commission and the prophetic commission coming together in dynamic synergy, that that's really what we're talking about, that foundation of the church. And unfortunately, on the foundation of pastors and teachers, the church becomes all about meeting needs instead of transforming the world. And Jesus died so that ultimately we would bring transformation to souls and to cities. 
to souls and saints and spheres, that ultimately the purposes of God were never that the church would become a consumer product. The church, the church was never intended to be a spectator organization where people go to church and they forget about their personal priesthood in Christ. We need the apostles and prophets to reestablish that truth in a way that every single member is maximized for ministry according to their God-given design and destiny. And this is why we need to shift, and this is the key benefit that we can expect to receive. The second benefit, though, is that the other three ministry gifts have a foundation to sit on where they are also seen as equally important, if not absolutely foundational. And they are aspects of the body that get awakened. The evangelistic gifting, the pastoral gifting, the teacher gifting, all of these gifts function together in dynamic five-fold harmony and synergy together to produce the fullness of Christ in the earth, that this is what we're looking for, to see every saint equipped for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto the perfect expression, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Okay, so that's the second thing, is that the other giftings are able to rise up fully and completely without disturbing the purpose of the body of Christ. Okay, they can do their part in relationship with the two foundational ministries. That's a benefit. The third benefit we want to hit is that the saints, every individual leader is equipped, and we are each one equipped to be the full display, the, the billion-piece jigsaw puzzle, <laughs> the billion-piece jigsaw puzzle coming together so that Jesus is manifest in every nation, every city, every neighborhood, that he's manifested in his fullness in every sphere of society, every marketplace, uh, education, medicine, media, entertainment. He's manifested everywhere because every single individual is equipped to function at the fullness of their God-given capacity and maturity in Christ. Okay, and then the next issue is that maturity and character that John spoke about a few minutes ago, that the character and the maturity of Jesus is manifested, because that's what you see in verses 13 through 15, that we are no longer children tossed to and fro, but we grow up into him in all things who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, and this is verse 16, the whole body, the church of Jesus Christ, being fit, fitted and joined together by that which every joint supplies and the effect, effectual working of every part doing its share produces the growth of the body, which is quantitative, and the building up of itself in love, which is qualitative. See, the five ministry gifts in verse 11 when they're functioning rightly on the right foundation, will produce verses 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16. And the world will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God, like the waters cover the sea, because God has reactivated every aspect of the ministry of Christ in his people for his glory, not for the glory of the gifted ones. In fact, if verse 12 isn't happening, Verse 11 is irrelevant, that this whole understanding is not about positions and titles. It's about function and fruit. And if we see the synergy of the apostolic and prophetic reestablished, we will see the fruit that I've just articulated. And so I look forward to walking that out with you guys. And this is what one of the things that we're moving towards as a movement, because as we've said before, Leaders Alliance is part of a bigger movement called Catch, Catch the Fire, that we're connected to one another to see the kingdom of God manifested on the earth. And we believe the key, or at least one of the keys to that, is the reestablishment of the partnership and the synergy between the apostolic and prophetic gifting. So with that, why don't we stop and we can actually take a few more comments from our Catalyst teams, or if anyone else wants to share a thought or ask a question, why don't you raise your hand and uh, you can go to the bottom where it says reactions and you can just raise your hand and we will uh, take the next uh, 10 minutes or so, eight minutes and just process a little bit more and then we'll close. Okay, so let's do that, you guys. Anybody have a comment?
or a question that they want to share. Yeah, my dear brother. I'm not sure which dear brother you're such talking a blessing. about. So, but... Yeah, why don't you go ahead and, and unmute and share. How are you talking about, Michael? Because I... Okay, yeah. Well, Jeff, if you want to share first, and then we'll have... Oh, yeah, I wasn't sure. You said dear brother, so I just jumped in there. Okay, no, go uh, ahead. Hey, I was just wondering, in moving forward, how we can best utilize this hub to 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 create some traction with this practically between um between us if you yes. could just speak into that well let me let me just say that um next week we have a dedicated day i'm actually going to be teaching in a ywam base with very little uh wi-fi ability so jordan's going to be uh helping to kind of host and and i want it, john bootsma if you're going to be on next week i want you to help guide this but we're going to go into our catalyst groups for pretty much the whole time. And we're going to be taking time to really process together what we've talked about today. Okay. Cause we want to really start to nail this. And I believe in each of the catalyst groups, there's going to be people who are more prophetic and more apostolic. And we can talk about this, even if you're, if it's not your primary gifting. So why don't we, this is what we're going to do, but over the next several months, weeks and months, we're going to actually be drilling into the synergy of these giftings and how they work together, because this is one of our primary mission statements as a, as a movement, as Leaders Alliance, is that we want to create the collaboration between the different gifts and callings of God to see the body of Christ manifested fully. But I want to get back to Paul. Paul, would you unmute and share kind of your thoughts on this? Paul is one of our, just our dear friends and, you know, amazing pastor from the Northland. Go um, ahead. I really appreciate the material today. I just wanted to say that the frustration I've experienced has been that, like in marriage, when people get married, they think love will keep us alive. <laughs> but there's a lot of soft skills and competencies that we have to learn to have a good marriage. Oh, that's good. And the problem between the gift things is is one of relational skills. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just highly recommend this book, um, Rare Leadership. Um, it, it it really gives you four pillars or core values to work through stuff. And it's built on an acronym RARE. The R stands for remain relational. And the principle is that the problem is always less important than the relationship itself. Good. And this is where I think our, our advertising is incongruent to people because we may be in a factory church, but we talk family, but right. we don't function like family. Right. And so when we have a disagreement, we don't press through and have hard conversations with the understanding that, hey, we're not getting divorced. We have to negotiate till we agree, but we have to negotiate. We have to talk. And, and, you know, in your family, when you have a kid who's acting out or whatever, you don't lock the front door. Right. You know, you, you guard over the conversation. The A stands for act like yourself, like be totally yourself. Authenticity. And the R, the next R stands for return to relationship, return to joy. The joy is in the connection and the relationship. Yes. And the E stands for something that also reflects our failure to work through problems like Romans 12 says about being devoted to one another and brotherly love. The mm. E stands for endure hardship. Yes. You know, Timothy says, endure hardship as good soldiers of Jesus Christ. In battle conditions, uh, there's a lot of stress and a lot of tension, but you don't jump ship, you don't retreat, you don't go AWOL. <laughs> you be loyal to your your people and 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 i think that those four uh principles have the potential of helping us to mature and grow so that we can develop the kind of culture that that you are talking about desiring today between yes. the gift things john yes. bootsma alluded to that too we right. need to have a culture that really fosters working through conflicts and seeing conflicts as opportunities. Yes. Not opportunities to bail, <laughs> yeah. but opportunities to lean in and press in and develop a, a deeper level of intimate covenant loyalty to one another. That's I think so 
the, Bi the Bible, Jesus said that that's how people will know that we're his disciples. Amen. That should make us really distinctive. And I, I think the short circuit from my point of view is simply that we haven't been faithful to really press through in different situations, yeah. generally speaking. <laughs> No, it's so true. And and uh, could you put that, uh, Paul, could you put that into this chat room? The, the name I of the put book? it. It's earlier in the chat. Oh, it's, the book yeah, is so called back, you guys. by Marcus Warner and Jim Wilder. Yeah. And, and, uh, and half of the book reflects brain science data. Yes. That shows that when we when we uh, stick to these core values, we really are successful in creating a rare kind of leader that's a protector, not a predator. <laughs> yes. And, um, and that's just awesome. And I, I want to also, uh, Jim Wilder has an amazing ministry called Life Model, and I'd love you guys to check it out. In fact, we had a previous, uh, uh, one of our boot, boot camps, or not a boot camp, but a master class was on the Life Model. And uh, they have tremendous teaching on connection, relationship, and really providing the, the culture. Um, I noticed that uh, Cesar put, put that in. Cesar, why don't you speak up? I'd love to hear from you on this because you're planting a new church in Jundai. Is that how I say it? And so if uh, Jundai, and so could you unmute and just greet everybody uh, and just say hi? Hi, Michael. It's good to be here. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, we are planting a church here in uh, Brazil, one hour from Sao Paulo, and at the city of Jundiaí. You are almost there, Michael. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> I was there. And we, we are a three-month church, so we are a baby yet, but we are uh, learning a lot. and experiencing uh, some incredible things from the Lord because uh, it's our first time planting church. So we stayed for 10, 13 years in the uh, past church that we were uh, involved in. Uh, the name is Zion Church in Sao Paulo. And we felt from the Lord to, to come to the city. We didn't know anyone here, anybody. And then we just come, we just uh, started the church and we are, we are uh, having some experiences with this, uh, the correct place that we need to put everyone. So when we talk here about uh, gifts and everything, I was, oh, okay, we need to <laughs> fix some things here and all these things, but uh, it's been a pleasure, and yes. we are we are so glad what what we what we with with the Lord and what He's doing here. So, uh, that his it. wife his wife Pamela is amazing, and and we're gonna get some more time together personally to see if there's anything I can do to support you guys and what you're doing. So I'm so proud of you for stepping out, and and I get to see some of that on on the on the uh, social media pages. Anyway, we're going to wrap up, but um, let me just say this as we close. Um, I just, I just want you guys to know that, you know, this passion to see the body of Christ fully equipped to represent Jesus fully in the earth is something that I know we all share, that this passion is something that we all share. And, and I want to just make sure that, you know, in the months to come, that as we partner together, as we work together, that we can start to zero in. You know, I know all of us carry different gifting. All of us carry different passions. We all have different flavors and temperaments. But I really believe that what, what we've built here is a family, a, a, a real sense of connection. And that family manifests most fully in the catalytic groups. And so, again, we want to welcome you to be part of those groups. Um, and join what we're doing. But, you know, over the next several months, is we're going to be doing some adjusting and changing and so forth. And uh, I'm excited about what God is is bringing us toward. And I, I just, uh, I'll be sharing more of that over the next several weeks, because I, I just believe that we've been getting a fresh download of vision 
for what God wants to do through this gathering. Mm -hmm.